Hello, thank you for joining me again. We are having Bible study today. We are walking with Jesus through his resurrection appearances. I believe it's so vital for Christian believers to really understand about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We don't serve a dead Savior. We serve a living Savior. And that's a fact that's absolutely vital to our faith. So it was that on that first day of resurrection, two of his disciples were going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now notice one thing before we go any further. Jesus only appeared in his resurrected state to believers, not to non-believers. He only came to his people. That in itself is fascinating. When we were in Israel, we drove by bus from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Now, one or two things about this we need to see. First of all, the walk that these disciples took. We find this in Luke 24 and verse 13. Now the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. Now it's just great to read that, isn't it? They just walked seven miles. Well, that's true. But if you go and look at the terrain, that was some walk. I mean, it was up and down. It was not just a flat seven-mile walk. And I have a feeling they might have done a good bit more than seven miles. Notice the subject they covered. They were talking about all that had happened to Jesus, the trials, the crucifixion, the burial, and now the empty tomb. And they're confused. Why was it they didn't recognize Jesus? We're not told. Some people think the Lord our God just closed that recognition. Others think there was a sadness in their heart. Others think there are preconceived ideas. They weren't expecting to meet the risen Jesus. Whatever it was, they didn't recognize him. Now Jesus asks a question and they respond. And of course, as so often with Jesus, his question was a setup. It's in verse 17. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers hand him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. That's a fascinating piece of conversation, isn't it? First of all, Jesus just asks a question and sets them up for what he wants to say. What are you discussing together as you walk along? He knew, but he wanted their response. And of course, they responded. You don't know what's been going on. Who are you that you don't hear? Now, Jesus never said he didn't know. He simply asked them what they were talking about. But it's a marvelous introduction to where he wants to take them. And you see, Jesus so often does this, doesn't he? There's a second setup, I find, and that's in verse 19. He comes back with yet another question. What things, he asked, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. Well, Jesus knew all that. But you see, so often he comes through with questions, the interrogative, just to set up the scene that he wants. And he did it beautifully with these two, and they responded beautifully. And then he could get on with what he wanted to say. Now notice their declaration as to who they thought Jesus was. Now they expand this a little bit. They start off by saying he was a prophet, powerful and word indeed before God and all the people. Well, that was true, but he was much more than that. And they had to see much more than that. And Jesus had to show them that as they walked along. But this was their declaration of who Jesus was. Then I find something else. Notice their further ideas about Jesus. This continues in verses 21 to 24, and they're talking to him. It says, and they're speaking, but we had hoped that he was the one who is going to redeem Israel. That's right. They thought of him as the Messiah. And then they went on and said this, and what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb 
and found it just as the women had said, but him they didn't see. If you notice that and analyze it, most of the time they're spending talking about the resurrection, the events of that day. But there's more than that. They declared the fact that he had died, that he was dead, he is crucified. At least they think he is. On the other hand, maybe he isn't. They're still a little confused on that. They had hoped that he was the Messiah. If you turn over a few chapters to Acts chapter 1, you find Jesus speaking again. And this is in his resurrected state just before he goes back to be with his father. And in verse 6 it says, So when the disciples met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So while they were expecting the Messiah, they were still seeing him as an earthly king, as an earthly leader, as someone who would get rid of Rome. They hoped that this is who it was. The idea of resurrection seems to have been missed. They told him the facts of the day, but they still hadn't seen the implication. Jesus' response is absolutely magnificent. He starts off in verse 25, O oh, foolish and slow of heart to believe. Isn't that interesting? I wonder what he'd say to us with some of our thoughts. And isn't it true that we're still like that? Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He gave them a Bible study, friends, and he gave it from the Old Testament, and everything he gave pointed to the Lord Jesus. Some of us don't know the Old Testament as well as the New. We don't feel it for us, but Jesus gets hold of the Old Testament, and he just gave a total study about himself. He just opened up the Scriptures to him. How did he know the Scriptures so well? Well, you say he was a son of God. Well, I don't accept that. I believe he was here in his human form. I believe he was limited. But I think he read it. And I think he studied it. And I think as he studied it, he absorbed it. I think there's something else. Because he was perfect, because he had not sinned, I think his brain could do what your brain and mine can't do. We're told by those who study these things that a genius uses 10% of his brain. Why? Well, the other 90% has been affected by the sin of mankind. All right, now we come to Jesus. Here is perfect man, and he's using 100% of his brain, and he's absorbing everything that's been said. And I think because of this, he knew the Old Testament, and he knew it well. And as he studied, he had taken it in, in the synagogue school. And that's why at 12 years of age, he could go into the temple and ask some pointed questions and give some very profound answers. He was able to use it all because sin had not broken that possibility as it has in us. Then there's an invitation of hospitality from these two disciples. Turn with me to Luke 24 and verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day's almost over. So he went in to stay with them. There's something very vital in verse 28. Do get hold of it. Jesus is never going to push in on your life. You have to invite him. And if you haven't invited him in, I'm sorry, but he hasn't come in. You know, God is the perfect gentleman. Some of us will push. Some of us will manipulate. The Lord our God never does. He loves. He woos us. He wants us. He desperately wants to spend time with us. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants us in his presence, but he'll never push us. He'll only love. And Jesus waited for the invitation. And then we find something else. They wanted to hear more. That's why they took him into the home. How thrilled they must have been. Here was this visitor. Still they hadn't recognized him. But to think that they were inviting the resurrected Jesus in just to have some supper and stay the night. And then the time of recognition comes. We find that in verse 30 and 32. Listen to the word of God. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? 
Didn't we realize that was Jesus? What's wrong? Anyway, how did they recognize him in the breaking of bread? Maybe they saw the nail prints in his hand. Maybe there was something special about the way Jesus broke bread and prayed. I'm sure there was. But something clicked and the lights went on and Jesus was gone. So here was Jesus, in some ways like us, and yet the resurrected body was different. He could be here and he could be there and he could move at will and he was not restricted by material things as we are. They were so sure that they were just thrilled on that road. Then something fascinating happens to me. Look, they took a return journey. Verse 33, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. Have you thought about that? Or do you just pass over it? We've already read they traveled seven miles. It was a difficult journey. When they found it was Jesus, they finished their supper, and they turned around and they walked back that seven miles straight away. They couldn't catch a bus. They didn't have a car. There they found the eleven and those who were assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon Peter. Then the two told what had happened to them on the road and how Jesus was recognized to them by the breaking of bread. What a moment that was. They went all the way back to Jerusalem and they found the other disciples and suddenly when they get there, they're going to burst in and you know they were planning all that seven miles what to say. And as they got in, immediately they're told, He's appeared to Peter. Well, yes, but we've seen him too. He walked with us along the road. He came in to have supper. And we recognized him when he broke the bread. You know, the whole place must have just about burst with praise and thanksgiving. Jesus was alive. They hadn't all seen him, but Jesus was about. And maybe they'd see him. Why had he appeared to these two? We don't know. But they'd had a marvelous Bible study. Let me ask you what I asked you yesterday morning. Do you really know the risen Jesus? Does he walk with you down the road? Does he go with you into the office? Is he with you around the home? For if you know the risen Christ, he dwells in you by his Holy Spirit, and he's there at all times. He doesn't just walk here and then disappear. He never leaves us. This is the powerful presence of our Lord Jesus. And he can be as real to you as he was to those two as they walked on the road.